thank you for coming to my presentation today. And uh, here we're talking about man versus machine. So um, quantitative investment has been on the rise in recent decades. And all major newspaper outlets have been talking about how technology is revolutionizing the investment management industry. Yet, we don't know that much about it, both uh, from in the real world, right? There is a lot of confusion in the news, but that's also due to the fact that we don't know a lot about it in academia either. And this is despite the fact that this could potentially impact markets' efficiency, liquidity, fragility, and a lot of other things that we care about. And the reason for this lack of knowledge, in a sense, is that the data to identify quantitative investors is not readily available. So even if we had theories and hypotheses, we couldn't possibly test them because we don't know who's quant and who's not, right? So let me start by restricting the scope of what I wish to tell you today about quantitative investment. So first of all, we're going to be looking at active US mutual funds equity mutual funds. So who are these guys? Well, basically investors give them their money to uh, manage actively. What does it mean? They have a benchmark and they're trying to beat the benchmark. So generate the famous alpha, right? Uh, so underway and overweigh certain stocks so that they can have a return which is higher than the benchmark. Now these are equity funds, meaning they're at least 80% of their assets are invested in US equities. Now, what does it mean to be a quant or a discretionary fund, a traditional, more human-based approach? Well, quantitative funds, they rely more on computer-driven models, fixed rules, and quantitative signals in making their investment decisions. Whereas discretionary funds, they rely more on human judgment. Now, that does not mean that there cannot be any level of human overlay in a quantitative fund. For instance, checking the soundness of automated trading signals. In the same way, discretionary funds can use some quantitative measures. Now, the point is, what is the key of the investment process? Is it a back-tested, computer-driven model, or is it human judgment? And what I wish to show you today is that whether it is one or the other, it will actually have a significant impact on all of the stages of the investment process, from what information we decide to learn about and how much of it, to what assets we decide to optimally hold in our portfolios, to our performance, and potentially how we affect the financial markets. So uh, let me give you a brief overview. I mean, spoiler alert, uh, in academia we like to give you an overview of what we're going to be doing later on so that you can follow through more complicated things with more ease. So what are we going to do? The first thing that I told you is that it's difficult to study this topic because we don't know who are the quants and who are not. So the first thing that I do is to try to create a novel classification of these funds that allows us to tell which ones are quantitative and which ones are not quantitative. So then we can study their behavior. And how do I do that? Well, I use a machine learning analysis of the fund's prospectuses, which are their mandatory, mandatory disclosures to the SEC. I'll tell you more in detail how that works, but what that allows me to do, it allows me to create a classification and to see, first of all, do we have many of these guys in this market? How's the relative share been changing over time? And once that's a given, well, we can have theories, we can have hypotheses that we can test and verify in the data. So the next thing that I do is precisely that. Well, what do we want to study about these funds? So I have a theoretical model, a rather simple model. I mean, it's complicated, but it has very simple assumptions and setup that can be easily understood. And that can give us some predictions, right? So if we believe that these guys learn differently and behave differently in a certain manner, then what should be their differences in their performance? What should be the differences in the assets they hold and so on? And so I generate different predictions that I can test empirically. I'll tell you more about that later, but the key point of this model, what I want you to uh, walk away from here with, is that there is a trade-off between capacity and flexibility. So if you're a machine, um, you can process much more information. Things that are machine processable, obviously, but the quantity of information that you can look at before making an investment decision is much larger. 
At the same time, though, you're less flexible than a human in adapting your behavior, mostly on what we think about traditional quantitative models based on backtesting and fixed rules and so on. So the flexibility in adapting to changing market conditions is lower. And these are the key points that I put into my model to get some predictions. So let me give you a brief overview of some of my results. Um, do on time, I cannot show you everything, but the key point is that humans being more flexible, they adapt, so the more quantitative investments enter in the market, the more the humans shift their attention and shift their behavior in order to maintain a competitive advantage. Then we have the quantitative investors, they hold more stocks, they have more similar strategies within each other than the discretionary investors, and also performance is very different. And one concept that really matters a lot in here is overcrowding. You might have read this stuff in the news, right? What does that mean? Well, it means that these guys, they do very similar things to each other, right? So if you want to think about it, if I know a piece of information that's unique, only I know it, well, I can make much more money in the market trading on the basis of this information. If now there are a lot of guys that know the same thing that I do, well, the profit that each of us can make is much less. So uh, now let me go more in detail into these different things that I've just told you. So hopefully you can get a better understanding on how this works. So the first thing, um, how do we document the rise of quantitative investment and who are quant, who are not? Well, as I told you, I do a classification. How do I build this classification? Well, these funds, and that's one of the reasons why we use mutual funds in here, is kind of a nice laboratory where they have a lot of regulation, they need to comply by a lot of things, so we can exclude a lot of alternative explanations, and we also have a lot of data to look at. And one of such things is that these funds by the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, they're required to publish quarterly, usually, these prospectuses, which are mandatory disclosures where they have to answer to a lot of questions by the SEC, and they need to truthfully say what it is that they're doing. So one specific section is called, uh, usually, Principal Investment Strategies. In here, these guys have to say two things. First, what are the main assets that they hold in their portfolio? And second, what are the key criteria that they use in selecting these assets? So what I will show you is that in this paragraph, there is information on whether a computer-driven model is really the key of the investment process or is not. And so what do I do? I collect um, all of these uh, prospectuses for the funds of interest, which are selected very standard way in academia, but they're those that I told you earlier, active equity mutual funds in the US. So I collect these prospectuses, and then I use machine learning. What does that mean? Well, without the technicalities of machine learning, it's actually very approachable to understand what this does. You have a training sample. So you have a sample of funds for which you know which ones are quantitative and which ones are discretionary with objective external criteria, right? And then you have this text for each of them. Now you can feed this information, these two pieces of information, the text and the classification, to these algorithms. And what they do is that they try to identify patterns in the text that are very informative in telling us which ones are quant and which ones are not. Okay, so the uh, one-liner of machine learning for text classification is really this. Uh, if you want to understand what that is conceptually, this is what you need to know. So um, what do I do? I use the standards in the machine learning literature to avoid in sample out of sample problems, meaning um, it works on the one sample I gave you, but really I found just a spurious pattern by chance, right? And it's not gonna work outside. So there are different things you can do to minimize these types of problems, and I do that. And eventually I choose one algorithm that is called random forest, which is actually very intuitive. It was one of the best performing, but I also chose it because in academia we care about knowledge, right? We care about what's happening. And a lot of these things, they tend to be black box. Whereas this random forest gives us some notion of what's happening behind the curtain. So what does that mean? What does the random forest do? Well, it's a decision tree based algorithm, which means that it identifies features, which in this case they're words or big grams. They're very informative in telling us whether it's quant or not. So let's say that the word quantitative is very informative. I'll split the sample according to whether the prospectus has or doesn't have the word quantitative. But it doesn't end there, because with that we would misclassify a lot of stuff. 
But then I identified that conditionally on having the word quantitative, and if you also has the word proprietary, then it's even more likely to be a quant, right? And you continue like that as a decision tree. Now to avoid problem, you do 10,000, 1,000 of those, and then you take an average, and then you have a classification which is quite accurate. I test this out of sample, and then I export this to my entire data set. Now, it's reassuring that since we're not giving it any structure, we're not telling it what are the words that I should be looking at, right? It's reassuring to see that a lot of the words that the algorithm identifies to be most informative, they're also very interpretable. Quantitative, uh, proprietary, model. Now, there are a few things that are less interpretable intuitively. So you see base. These are stemmed words. So base is like based, for instance. So I went and read a lot of this stuff. I was like, why is base so important? And then I saw that for a lot of these prospectuses, the quant guys would say, oh, we use a quantitative model based on these factors, based on these criteria. And that was a very standard formulation. So if you think about the conditional nature of this algorithm, conditionally on have the word quantitative, then based becomes very informative in saying if it's actually a quant or not. So this is reassuring. And then what did I do? Well, I checked. How many quants do we have and how has this been evolving over time? Since we have a lot of data on mutual funds, I could do that. And we can see that quantitative investment has been growing much faster than discretionary investment since 1999, which is where my sample starts. So now what do we have? Well, we have a classification. We know that this is relevant and we know that this is growing. If they behave differently than the traditional funds, then we would like to know that as well. And what are the implications of this? So the next thing I do, I develop a model. Why a model? Well, models help us guide our thinking, right? Now I have a classification, zero, one, who's quant, who's not quant. I can test any number of things. And if I can test things at random, I will find something for sure, right? But then if we have a model, what that tells us, it like kind of puts some boundaries, right? You cannot have that you find this thing, but you cannot find, you don't find this other thing because these two things are not consistent, right? So it puts some structure to our thinking and it allows us to really verify if our theories are correct. So what is this model? I tried to remove all of the equations from this. If you actually look at it, it has a lot of equations, but I think it can be explained simply. So I told you about the trade-off, capacity, flexibility in acquiring information. So when we trade, what we care about is information, right? If I am more informed than you and I trade against you, it's more likely that I'm going to win from this trade. So this model is a model of information, a model of learning. And how it's built is that, well, there are three periods. First, I need to learn. So in the first period, investors decide what to learn about. In the second period, investors decide what to invest on. So what portfolio do I want to hold? And in the third period, um, assets uh, pay off. It means the returns are realized, right? Very simple. Now, what are these assets? What's the payoff of these assets? There is the risk-free rate. Imagine like a T-bill, like you've seen in your capital markets course, probably, right? Um, and then there are risky assets. You can think about these risky assets as stocks in the stock market. Now, the return of these risky assets, what is it influenced by? Well, it's influenced by some aggregate shock. So some shock that affects everyone up to some exposure, beta, right? And then it has some idiosyncratic shock, something specific to that single stock. Um, the CEO dies. That's unrelated to what's happening in the market, right? So there are always these two things. That's why when you look at portfolios, you diversify the portfolio because the idiosyncratic risk kind of goes away, right? So you always have these two things that determine the return on any asset. So what does it mean to learn? Well, what do I want to learn about? I want to learn about these risks, right? Because if I'm very informed about the risks, then I can trade in a better way and I can uh, earn more from these trades. Um, what are the risks? Where well, there are the idiosyncratic risks, one for each stock. And then there is this aggregate risk that affects everyone up to some exposure, right? The beta of each stock can be different. And what is important about the learning? What is important is how precise is my information? If I only look at one piece of information, probably my information is not very precise. I just looked at one thing making some inference. If I look at a lot of pieces of information to try to assess what is that risk, probably I have a more precise information. So that's the whole point, right? Where is the precision of the information? How much information can I look at before 
having my expectation for what these uh, risks are going to be. So what I'm saying here is, well, if I'm a discretionary guy, if I'm a human, probably I cannot process like infinite information. I will be able to process a certain amount, which is what, given the time frame, I'm able to process in my head or with my team, right? So I will have to optimally decide what do I want to learn about? How do I maximize this capacity that I have for learning? If I'm a quant guy, well, let's say I have infinite processing capacity. We know that that's not right, but as a simplification compared to the human. So, well, I will process everything that is available and that is machine processable. So I cannot process some soft information, but as long as something is processable, I'll try to process it. So this is how I model these guys. There are some unskilled investors. They don't really learn. They observe the prices, but they don't have this capacity for um, inferring more precise information about the risk. So they learn for the price, they're rational, and they trade on the basis of that. Among the skilled guys, there are the quants and there are the discretionaries. As I was just telling you, the discretionaries, smaller capacity for processing information, I have to optimally decide what I want to learn about. But I'm flexible. I can learn about any type of shock I want to. I can learn about the idiosyncratic part, the aggregate part, and I can change whenever I want, right? As a human, I can adapt. Now, the quantitative guys, and the assumptions in here are very relative to the context I'm studying, US equity mutual funds, active guys. What are their constraints? Well, exactly the opposite. I can process as much information I want, as long as it's machine processable, but I'm not very flexible. So what's the mandate of these guys? They have a benchmark, they need to pick stocks out of the benchmark. So when they go and develop their models, their models are based on this, selecting assets that I want to overweigh or underweigh with respect to a benchmark. So the core of their models is really stock selection. So it's really looking at this idiosyncratic information about each asset and being able to beat the market on the basis of that. Now what about the aggregate information? Well, what these guys say they do is that modeling macroeconomic fundamental information into these types of asset selection models is very complex in a mathematical sense, right? So what do they say they do? Well, we also have the price. We're learning from this idiosyncratic stuff, and we're learning for the price. The price, as we know, is determined by both these very stock-specific things, but also the aggregate. So if I have a very precise information about the stock specific part, I can kind of back out from the price what is happening at the aggregate level. So these guys say it's much simpler for us to do it that way than to model this macroeconomic world systematically. And so this is what this assumption of my model means. Now I didn't just trust the industry on this, and I'm gonna, not going to show this today, but I did some tests in my data to verify if effectively these discretionary guys switch more between looking at one type of information and the other, and the quants don't. And I do effectively verify that. So then what do I do? Okay, these are my assumptions. I solve the model. What does it mean to solve a model? Well, you have assets, you have people, People are trading with each other. Eventually, one price needs to emerge for every single asset, right? It's demand and supply. Demand needs to equal supply. So when you solve these types of models, that's exactly what you're doing. Given the way that the investors are learning, given the way that they're trading, and given that they are rational people, um, they trade against each other. Um, we put supply equal demand, and then we see what should be the prices. What should be the behavior of each investor given these conditions? So that's what it means to find an equilibrium of a model, right? So um, the two things that I want you to know about this equilibrium that are important for the predictions that we test in the data are two. First of all, as I said, the discretionary guys, I want to optimally allocate my capacity for learning. So I want to maximize that capacity learning about what is going to give me the most profitability, right? And as we said earlier, what is most valuable information to know? Is it information that everybody else knows? Or is this some information that only I know or that few people know about, right? And obviously, it's more valuable to know stuff that not that many people will know about. So whenever I'm deciding what to learn about, I'll take that into consideration. So the marginal benefit for learning is higher for things that I think fewer people will be learning. 
and uh, we call this a substitution effect, right? So I want to learn more about things that very few people know about. And the second point, which is um, a quando, kind of a common result in these types of <coughs> models, is that the weight that I will decide to put into a risky asset, say a certain stock, it will be greater, the greater is the precision of my signals. So the greater is the precision of the information I have about that stock, the more confident I am in investing in that one. So optimally, I will put more of my money into those assets that I have better information about. Putting together the information I gather from the price, my priors, and the information that I decide to learn about. So these are the two key points. Now, what am I going to tell you next? I'm not going to tell you all my results, but I picked a few that I think are interesting. I'm going to give you some intuition from my model of what should happen and why. And then I'm going to show you that effectively, when I take my classification to the data, I verify that that model prediction is in the data. So we start from the very simple one, because I've just told you this, right? So quantitative funds, they learn about more assets, because they have more capacity for learning. So they will have a more precise information about more of these stocks. I just told you that you're more confident in investing in things that you know more about. And if these guys know more about more stocks, well, then they should hold more stocks in their portfolio as compared to the discretionary guys, right? So let's look at a simple regression in the data. These are what we call panel regressions. So what panel regressions are is that for each fund I have a time series. So for each fund I have values for um, all of the months and I have that for each single fund that I'm interested in. So uh, what does this regression tell us? Well this quant is simply a dummy variable. That classification that's zero, one. If I am a quant, it's one. If I'm not a quant, it's zero. So what this is telling us is that on average, quantitative funds, they hold about double the number of stocks as discretionary funds do, which is what our model would predict. Now, if we look at the distribution of the number of stocks, we see that for a big percentage of these quant funds, they hold up to 10 times more stocks than what the average discretionary fund would do. Um, now, we have learned from capital markets, from basic uh, uh, portfolio theories that we want to diversify, right? So if these guys hold more stocks, does it mean that they're more diversified? So does that mean that their portfolios are less risky? So that's what I do next. I build different measures of portfolio risk, the simplest of which is uh, volatility of returns, 12 months rolling volatility of returns. And there are other more complex measures that take into account risk exposures, other risk exposures to the factors. But what we can see from here is independently from what measure, measure I use, quantitative funds have statistically lower <coughs> risk in terms of volatility of their returns or excess risk of their returns. And that's a very kind of intuitive thing, right? They hold more assets, they're more diversified, we should expect this. Next point, also about the holdings. Well, what did I tell you? The humans are flexible, right? They adapt. So if I'm deciding optimally to learn about something, well, I'm not going to learn about something that all of these quants are going to learn about. And I know these guys, they have more capacity for learning than me. So if I'm training, trading against them on something that they have a lot more information than me about, well, that's likely to be a losing trade, right? So if I'm deciding optimally what to learn about, I'll try not to learn about those things that I expect the quants to know a lot about. So what are these things? Well, I call this thing information gap. What does that mean? Well, the quants are going to learn everything that's available and machine processable. Me as a human, I can learn any type of information. I can go and have a chat with the manager. I can uh, go to a warehouse and see if it's clean, if I think that that's a signal that they're running the company well, things that a quant cannot look at, right? So I will want to learn about those assets for which there is relatively less information available out there, and potentially those for which there could be more soft information, right? So if I want to optimally allocate my attention, I'll pay attention to those things on which I think I can have a competitive advantage. So that's what the model tells us. Now let's look at what the data tells us, right? So I built some measures to proxy, so to approximate this idea. What are the stocks for which there is less information out there and potentially more soft information? Well, probably small stocks. I have less information out there than large, big stocks. 
probably stocks for which I have a shorter history. If you think about quantitative model, I need a long history to have statistical significance of my model. So if the history is shorter, well, probably the quants are not going to have that big of an advantage. Um, I look at news. If something is really talked about in the news, it's more likely that there is more information out there about uh, a certain, that asset than something else. So I look on average, the stocks that these funds are holding over time, and not just that they're holding, the stocks that they are active on. Remember, these guys are benchmarked. So you should expect them to hold all of these assets because, say, they're holding the benchmark. But when I deviate from the benchmark, so when I hold a percentage of the stock different than what the percentage should be on the benchmark, that deviation, do I deviate more uh, towards small stocks, uh, less followed stocks, shorter history stocks, if I'm a discretionary guy than if I'm a quant guy? And this is the question I'm trying to ask here. So what we see here is that I'm, if I'm a discretionary guy, on average, I will hold stocks that are statistically smaller, younger, and less mentioned in the media. <laughs> And that's one more thing that the model explains us why that should be happening. Um, the third thing about the holdings is that concept of overcrowding that I told you earlier. Now, if you think about the model, what you have is that the quantitative guys, they will learn everything that is available and machine processable. Then, of course, they can, they can interpret this information slightly differently, but on this first layer, they have very similar input into their investment process. The discretionary guys instead, in a sense, they have two layers of differentiation. Why is that? Well, first I need to decide what to learn about. And I want to learn about stuff that other people are not learning about. So we might all decide to learn about slightly different things, right? And then in a second stage, we can also interpret the information <coughs> differently. But you see that there is a bigger difference in our learning. We can learn about different things and we can interpret them differently. For the quants, in general, they're learning very similar things, then they can interpret them differently. But it's tougher to be different than the others if we're looking at very similar information. So what the model predicts is that among quantitative funds, their portfolios, the portfolio that they hold, they should be more similar to each other than among discretionary funds. So let's look at the data. So what do we have? I built two measures of um, overcrowding or, or similarity of portfolios. One is a dispersion. It's what we call a distance measure, right? So this is the weight that um, a certain fund will put on stock I. And this is the weight that the average fund of my type, so that the average quantitative fund, will be putting on that stock in that same period of time, right? So how different is the weight that I put with respect to the average weight that other quants or discretionary put on the same asset? That's what this measure means. And this is a commonality measure. What's a commonality measure? Well, these are the percentage of uh, quantitative funds, let's say, that are active on the same stock that I am on a given period of time. So on average, what is the percentage of other funds of my type that are being active on the same stocks that I am, right? So these are the two measures that I look at to test that uh, prediction from the theory. And let's look at statistical significance, right? So we have the, the discretionary guys, they on average have a higher dispersion and lower commonality in their portfolio holdings with respect to other discretionary guys. What this means? Well, the discretionary portfolio, they look more different among each other than if we look at the quant portfolios, which is exactly what the model uh, would have predicted. Now you're starting to get the gist of it, right? Why do we need models, right? I could have looked at 10 different things. Well, why these three? Because they're consistent with each other given what the model tells us. So we're starting to build a story, right? So let's look at a couple of things on performance and, and then we're gonna conclude. I have more results, but uh, not that much time. So performance. So um, there is another paper I am building on here. And these guys, they have a very similar setup to me, but they don't have the quant guys. For them, all the guys are discretionary. And what they find is that these discretionary guys will be flexible, and the most skilled ones, they shift their attention from learning about idiosyncratic shocks, so stock-specific risks in expansion, to learning about aggregate shock, market-wide <coughs> risk in recession. <coughs> 
Why is that? Because a lot of academic research told us that in recession, this market-wide risk is much higher. So if I need to decide what to learn about, well, I want to learn about the biggest risk, right? Because both I can protect my portfolio better, but if I know more about the biggest risk than other people, I can also profit more from it, right? So what these guys find is that um, funds um, that shift attention, they perform better than funds that don't shift attention. And they find that the average out alpha of mutual funds is much greater in recessions than in expansions, when we have these big shocks that we can learn about. So what I wanted to check is, well, first, do I find the same thing in my data that these guys find? And second, is this different for quant and discretionary guys? Because if the quant guys, they don't have that much flexibility, then we shouldn't find that they're able, just during the recession, to go and learn about something else and make a big profit from it, right? So what do I do? I look at alphas. You have seen alphas in uh, capital markets, I guess, around these days, <coughs> if you're first year. So what are alphas? Well, they the excess return once you have control for common risks, right? The cap M only controls for the market risk. Three factor, four factor, they also control for other known risks like small and uh, big stocks, uh, high and low book to market stocks, momentum and contrarian stocks and so on. So what we're interested in is the alpha. And the alpha, is it different in recessions than it is in expansions? And what we find is that effectively when I look at the average in the data set, these guys were right. In recessions, the average alpha of these funds is much greater and statistically significant than it is in expansions. But is this different for quant and discretionary guys? And what we can see here is that effectively for quant guys, the performance in recession is significantly lower than the performance in recession for the discretionary guys. Now, the last thing, when I first looked at this regression, I was a bit puzzled. Because the big elephant in the room was going to be like, well, but then do these guys perform much better in expansions, right? Because they're looking at all of these uh, stock-specific risks. It's really important in expansion. Do they make a killing? And we look at this and it's like, not really. On average, that's not very statistically significant. But why is that? So I went back to the model, and I started looking at this thing, and it's like, am I tricked? Does the model tell us something about this? And actually, it does. So when I went back and looked at the performance of the quants in the model, what you find is that as more and more quants enter this market, you think each of them, they have a big capacity for learning, right? So if you have a lot of these guys with a lot of information, well, my information is not that valuable anymore, mostly if I'm doing very similar stuff to the other quants in the market. So I would expect that over time, the profitability of this average quant guy would be decreasing, because I've shown you initially that there are more and more quants entering this market. So in this very simple regression, and I look at it in different ways, it's probably not the best way, but it gives us some already indication of that. I look over time, I split my sample in different time periods, and I look over time, this is the performance of the quants. Is the performance of the average quant been decreasing over time in expansions? And that's indeed what I find. The performance in the first expansion was much greater than in the second expansion, which was still greater than nowadays. Now, what I wanted to see is like, OK, but are there some quant guys that are still being able to perform better? And then I thought about the commonality measure, right? So if we remember that commonality measure, we can see that it has two peaks. So there's a lot of quant guys that are doing a lot of the same stuff, but there are also some that are doing something different. So what I checked is, are the guys that are doing something different the ones that are still performing better? And this is what this tells us. Yes. So the guys that have a more diversity in their portfolio with respect to the other quants, they're able to still maintain a significant performance despite the fact that a lot of quants now enter this market. So this is all that I'm going to show you today about my research. So to conclude, what have I done here? Well, first, I've documented that this is something important that we should look at. And hopefully, I've provided a tool that allows us to do more research on this topic, which is a classification that tells us who's who, so we can look what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. The second thing, very simple model. I identified some very simple criteria in a guided way that tell us that effectively, these guys are different. So we should care, because they might impact the markets differently. 
Now the biggest question is, which is what I think is most interesting about my research, is that it makes you think about this in a certain framework, right? It starts to make you think about it in the perspective of like, okay, if this trade-off between capacity and flexibility is really important, where are we heading? What is happening today, right? And if we see the big trends that we observe today in the market, what are they? Big data, artificial intelligence. If we think big data, what does that do? Well, without a computer, we cannot even process it. It increases that capacity requirement for data processing. And what it's the aim of artificial intelligence to give flexibility to machines. So that machines can learn on their own um, without having these strict rules that are based only on the past, they can adapt. So if we think about this trade-off between capacity and flexibility and the directions that the industry is taking today, this makes it very, very interesting. And the question becomes, will they catch up? Are they catching up? How is this going to happen? Which I think are very exciting questions for future research. And I just want to leave you with one thing. I'm like, if we still have one choice, maybe we can pull the plug. <laughs> Thank you.